what's going on guys welcome to the channel i'm ben i've been riding klr 650s for the last eight years now and i've had my last 2022 gen 3 for the last two years and i've decided it is now time to move on to something else in the last video that I put out like this, I was comparing it against the V-Strom 800DE, the Transalp 750, the KTM 390, and the all-new redesigned Himalayan Royal Infield 450. The KLR 650 is definitely a bit of a tough act to follow. There's some things that I really like about it, and definitely some things that I think a lot of you guys probably like about it too. So to move on to something else can kind of be a little bit hard and maybe even a little bit disappointing, which is why I'm kind of going through all of my options here before I decide on something new. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure that this is the route that I'm going to go, but a lot of you guys have suggested this bike to me, so I figured I might as well at least take a look at it and give it a chance. So Harley Davidson in general is probably the brand that you would assume that somebody from Wisconsin would be interested in, but coming from the family that I did, or at least having the dad that I did, uh, Harley wasn't something that was anything that we were too interested in. However, that did change slightly when they came out with the Pan America a couple years ago. So today, of course, we're going to be looking at the 2024 and the starting price is pretty much, I think the biggest reason that this is probably not going to be the bike that I'm going to go with. Obviously, this bike isn't really intended to be sort of the next step from a KLR 650. Um, I think there's a few steps in between that and, and this. However, if you bought a KLR as sort of just an entry level and now you're ready to move up to something that is going to be a little bit more difficult to ride off-road uh, due to some of the stuff that we'll be looking at here in a minute. I think maybe it's not a bad option. Honestly, the only reason that I'm even considering this bike is because it has the option to be purchased with the laced or spoked wheels. The cast wheels are totally fine for adventure touring, but if you want to do real adventure riding, meaning more than just gravel roads, you definitely need a spoked wheel. A cast wheel is going to take an impact and then not bounce back where the spoked wheel I can tell you from experience will definitely take one heck of a beating from rocks and logs and sticks and everything I it, it still blows my mind some of the impacts that my front wheels have taken over the years and just seem to be totally fine so definitely lace wheels is what you want to go with don't don't buy cast if you're going to do anything more than like gravel roads uh, but that is a thousand dollar add to an already twenty thousand dollar motorcycle uh, the gray here is definitely kind of cool uh, not a bad color by any means but if i was going to buy one i would definitely go with black which is a three hundred dollar add and i think the prices go up as you go further to the side here 550 $650 and honestly I think the black is the best looking but anyway uh, definitely a really 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 cool looking motorcycle uh, there are some things that I'm not a huge fan of as far as the design goes I think from every angle from uh, here to here looks really cool but then the front I'm not sure what they were going for to me it looks like an angry refrigerator from the 1960s uh, just not my thing. Uh, the rest of it definitely is cool. The back kind of makes me think a little bit of my dad's old XC800 Tiger, uh, the V-Twin. I mean, as much as I love the motors that they're putting in adventure bikes now, the uh, parallel 270 degree crank motors, uh, there's just something about a big V-Twin that is, that is really kind of cool. The exhaust, how low this is hanging, just like the Tenere 700, I really don't like that. This is going to be the first thing that hits the ground on this side of the bike. I just, I don't know why they're doing that. I guess maybe it'll be the second because it looks like they do have some decent side protection on here. As to whether or not this is going to hold up to a decent impact, of course that kind of remains to be seen, but it is nice that they give you some protection here. Uh, the protection that they give you for your hands is looks like just plastic, so that's useless garbage. I guess good for wind protection, but that's about it. One thing that I noticed here is that the skid plate doesn't really seem to cover the exhaust uh, very far, and this actually giant box here is still exhaust. This is a catalytic converter, I would assume. And all this is going to have to get covered up if you're going to do any decent off-road riding. But anyway, let's take a look at the specs and see what they've all packed into this thing. So the Revolution Max engine is a 150 horsepower V-twin 
1,250 cc's ish, I would assume. I mean, that is just a giant motor. That is almost twice as large as the Tenere 700. That is that is a big, big motor. Adaptive suspension, adaptive ride height allows you to lower the seat when stopped and also maintain a constant optimum suspension sag by continually adjusting preload. Definitely kind of like a marketing thing, but also, I mean, super cool. I mean, every adventure bike should have that, right? Why not give you extra ground clearance when you're off-road and then drop down a little bit lower when you need to stop. However, I'm not sure if that really adjusts fast enough uh, for when you have one of those oops moments where the bike shuts off and you suddenly have to deal with however much this thing is going to weigh. And we'll get into that in a second here. Uh, again, more about the ride modes. Um, a lot of different nice options here for riding in uh, sport mode, rain, uh, off-road, off-road plus. I mean, you can adjust a bunch of different custom settings in here. Really kind of cool. And essentially what that's all doing is basically controlling your preload and your compression and maybe rebound damping too, uh, to kind of optimize things, which is honestly kind of neat. I mean, it, as much as I like tinkering, it would be kind of nice to just press a button and have the bike perfectly set up for, I guess, hopefully my weight and riding conditions. Let's check out some dimensions here. So the seat height here, I think this, the, these two different numbers, I would assume is gonna be according to the ride height for that adaptive riding. Uh, either that or it has something to do with being able to swap out a seat. I'm not entirely sure, but either way, I mean, honestly, I don't really think it matters. If I pull up my cheat sheet for my KLR specs here, the 2022 Gen 3 that I've got, the seat height is going to be 32.1 if you were to go with the, I guess, 2023 or 2024 S model. Uh, but my my version of it, just the regular one, the seat is 34.3 inches off the ground. And for me, with the 31 inch inseam, uh, with my weight 160 pounds and uh, my height and everything uh, being 510, it all feels pretty good. Uh, but when I was starting out, especially trying to start out on a heavier bike, which you should never do. If this is if this is your first adventure bike that you're looking at, you're looking in the wrong spot. Buy a light dual sport or buy this and a light dual sport and learn your dirt skills on the dual sport and just enjoy riding this on the road until you're ready to ride a big bike off-road. Having a lower seat height like this, 31.1 or even 32, I mean, it really opens this bike up to a lot more people. I, I don't know why Japanese manufacturers have always been making their seats so tall. It just compounds the problem of the bike already being heavy and just makes it uncomfortable and really definitely hard to learn on and not something that I would recommend. So anyways, definitely good to see that lower seat height. The ground clearance though, that I'm not so happy to see. And it definitely doesn't look very good in comparison to the 8.3 inches of ground clearance on the KLR. I mean, that's, that's almost an inch and a half lower. So that's more than enough to be the difference between sliding over a rock or absolutely smashing into it. Seven inches is not really not enough for a bike that, as we'll soon see, is a little heavier than the KLR. So what else do we got here? Rake and trail are the next two things that I'll look at and we'll actually scroll up to take a look at the 360 view to kind of give you guys an idea of what that is. So if you were to essentially draw a line kind of straight down here, the difference between that imaginary line and where the forks are, as far as angle in comparison, that is the rake number. So on the Pan America, we've got a 25 degree rake. So that basically means that the forks are stuck out at a 25 degree angle from that vertical mark. And if we compare that to the KLR, you'll notice that it's quite a bit different. Five degrees doesn't seem like a whole lot, but when you're talking about something as long as the forks, it really does make a pretty big difference. And if you guys have never seen the video a couple years back, my dad and I tested out his XC800 Tiger, which was like a 2013 versus my Tenere 700. And those two bikes had like a five-ish degree difference in rake, give or take a few, uh, but it was very noticeable that the 
one with less rake. The tiger had a much harder time riding off-road. It, it always felt like it wanted to fight you to the ground. It always felt much more heavy than it was. And of course, there's a lot of stuff that goes into how a bike feels off-road. But rake, I think, is a very important one to look at. So 25 isn't horrible. I believe that is a little bit more than what the XC800 Tiger was. But it's still just not as much as the KLR. And even the difference between the Gen 2 that I had originally and the Gen 3 now the couple of degrees that they added in rake to get to this 30 did make a noticeable difference. Uh, the other number on here, the trail, uh, which is 4.3 up here on the Pan America and 4.8 on the KLR. Basically that, that measurement, that 4.3 or the 4.8 is sort of from that straight line down to how far the wheel, I believe it's the center of the wheel is. Um, so again, not a huge thing, but something that sort of goes hand in hand and it's definitely worth Understanding in a very basic way, anyhow, because it'll give you an idea of how the bike is going to handle off-road. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. So a 19 front and a 17 rear is uh, pretty much adventure touring numbers. If you were looking at a bike that is really meant for off-road, hard off-road adventure riding, this is going to be a 21. It's not going to be a 19. 21 is what they put on dirt bikes and dual sports alike. It's just what works the best um, for a lot of different reasons. Not so much on the road though, uh, which I, I believe is why they probably went with this. I, I think they assume, uh, especially because some of the specs that we're going to run into here that you can already see, this bike looks like it can definitely do some off-road riding and any bike can do intense off-road riding, just maybe not as well as something that is set up a little bit better for it. But I think you definitely could take this bike off-road through some gnarly stuff. I would really like to, but uh, 19 is kind of kind of small and really meant more for the road, to be honest. And I guess I don't have that on my cheat sheet here, but the KLR is a 21 front and a 17 rear. Now, fuel capacity actually kind of looks close to KLR numbers, honestly. Uh, we've got a 6.1 gallon tank on the KLR, always have. The only thing is the KLR, I think, gets about 50-some miles to the gallon, uh, where this is only going to make, uh, I think, like 45 or something like that that we'll run into later. So those numbers aren't quite going to be maybe as close as they seem like they are uh, as far as actually how many miles you're going to get to the tank, but still a pretty decent sized tank. Now, the weight here is definitely going to be a bit of a factor off-road. So we've got weight as shipped, 534 pounds, weight in running order or wet weight. It seems like it wouldn't add up much, but when you talk about four whatever quarts of oil, almost five quarts of oil, uh, your antifreeze, uh, a full tank of gas, even three gallons of gas is going to weigh almost 20 pounds. So of course it definitely can extend your range, which is nice, but it does add a bit of weight and weighed down with a full tank of gas, the Pan America is 112 pounds heavier than supposedly what my 2022 non-ABS KLR model weighs. That is a lot of weight. However, uh, this bike, it does appear like uh, it's going to come with crash protection for the front. There's not really much in the way of anything else in the rear. Um, and I mean, I guess we've already got a metal bash plate on here. So, I mean, you're still probably going to want a thicker plate on here. Hopefully these are enough. The KLR uh, all weighed down with all the stuff that I've got on it without any bags or anything, just the simply the crash protection of my new handlebars and bark busters and whatever else that I've got thrown on there. Not, not a whole lot. It was a lot more, I guess, than I thought it would be. And of course, weight distribution is almost, if not more important than the actual total weight. So if they kept enough of the weight low down, maybe it's not going to feel like a heavy bike. You can definitely have a very light bike with the weight up high that feels very heavy and vice versa. You can have a bike that has a lot of weight to it, but it's distributed properly and it'll feel maybe not light, but easy to maneuver and easy to pick up. Of course, those aren't things that I can tell you sitting here on my computer, but I would assume that some of that had been sort of calculated with the way that they've got everything distributed here, as far as I can tell. And let's see what we've got as far as an engine. So the big 1250 max here, uh, kind of a higher compression ratio, I think, or high-ish, I guess. And as you sort of bump up the performance of any engine, it doesn't matter what it is, the reliability is going to start to go down a bit just because you're squeezing more power out of the same engine. What else do we have here? Performance, what does that motor do for us here? So 
95 foot pounds of torque and 150 horsepower. That is <laughs> insane. 110 horsepower more. The Tenere 700 only has like 70 some horsepower. And if you guys have ever seen two different numbers uh, for the same type of bike, a lot of times the high number is what the motor puts out and then the lower number is what you get at the wheel. You can change the way horsepower feels through gearing, but you don't ever lose horsepower unless uh, I guess you put, <laughs> put emissions on it or uh, if you basically have some place in the driveline that is generating a lot of heat. Heat is the only way that you actually lose horsepower. So your chain, anything inside your transmission, um, obviously those things get quite warm when they're running. So you do lose some horsepower that way from the engine to the rear wheel. And that's why you see those different numbers from time to time. But either way, I mean, there's no doubt about it. 150 horsepower and 95 foot pounds of torque is insane. Of course, the bike is a bit heavier. So the power to weight ratio, eh. So we take 569, the weight divided by 150 horsepower that is 3.79 pounds for each horsepower the klr 456 divided by 40 11 pounds per horsepower that's a substantial amount more weight so definitely a very impressive engine in the pan america and like i said earlier 46 miles to the gallon honestly is still pretty impressive i mean 150 horsepower and 46 miles of the gallon. I'm not going to complain about that too much. Sure, you could get 56, like the KLR probably could, but I mean, a whole extra cylinder and 110 more horsepower. Man, they put together one heck of a bike as far as that goes anyway. So drivetrain, uh, it looks like this is not anything fancy. It's just going to be regular old chain and sprockets. Having a six gear is definitely something that's nice. I have looked for a six gear on my Gen 2 and my Gen 3 probably a thousand times and uh, still never found it. So it definitely would be nice to have a six gear. We've got 47 millimeter inverted forks, which are adjustable. Back is a single mono shock also electronically adjustable. So when you change those ride heights, that is actually going to change a whole bunch of stuff inside of your front and rear suspension, which is honestly awesome. And probably what most bikes will go to eventually one day. Um, so a little bit futuristic, but something that you see in the Africa Twin and the BMWs and that sort of thing. As far as the brakes go in the back, we've got a four piston caliper, which is pretty darn big. Uh, I guess it's a big bike though. And up front, we've got rotors on both sides. It doesn't give me any sizes or anything, uh, but they're definitely going to need to work well to stop all the weight and to keep up with all the power that this bike makes. Uh, electronic stuff, Daymaker headlight, that could look a little bit better. Uh, 6.8 inch TFT display. Infotainment. So there's our screen size again. So because you can connect your phone to this and probably run, I would assume, most of your GPS maps, uh, that's really going to be kind of a cool thing uh, with the ability to keep your phone safe in your pocket, which is really where a phone should be on a motorcycle. You shouldn't have it up on the dash. That's just silly. Just another distraction, and we sure don't need any of that on the road. But it does really seem like they have put together a pretty good package as far as the electronics go. You don't have to pay extra for the charging ports or anything. That stuff just already there for you. Uh, really kind of par for the course with these more expensive uh, adventure bikes and really uh, some nice stuff, I think. And all of this stuff, I mean, it's all marketing terms, but honestly, some of it, I mean, really seems like it might be pretty helpful off-road. Vehicle hold control, uh, if it is what I think it is, would be pretty sweet. Uh, traction control, of course, if it works well. Um, I mean, really, all of these things, even, even ABS, if they don't work well, they're not going to be anything you want. But if they do work well, I mean, if they work really well, better than better than you can ride the bike, you know, or if it can work well with you, I mean, I don't really see a reason not to have it. If it works well, I mean, the only reason to complain about it is just to complain. And obviously without riding, it, it's going to be hard to tell, but it does look like they really put some pretty crazy stuff into this, like the wheel lift mitigation. I don't know if that's in the bumps or like they're actually concerned that the front wheel is going to come off the ground. I don't know. If that's the case, that'd be pretty sweet. I don't know if 150 horsepower is enough and 90, 95 uh, foot-pounds of torque is enough to, to get that front wheel off the ground with as big as the bike is, but I guess you never know. Uh, definitely some cool stuff and obviously something that you would have to really use uh, to be able to understand whether it was going to be helpful or not. So like I said, even though I'm not thinking that this is actually going to be my next bike, 
I figure it is worth it to build it up and see exactly what it would cost me if I really, really, really had to have one. So I think I would probably go with the black. If I was going to spend $20,000, what's another $300 more? And I mean, of course, we got to go with the laced wheels. So that's only $1,300 more. Uh, I guess at least we get the crash protection. But like I said earlier, this skid plate, I mean, just doesn't look like it's really going to be enough. I mean, I, I would have to, I would have to upgrade that at the very least. Let's see what else do we got? Adaptive ride height is another twelve hundred bucks. Oh man, I don't know if I could spring for that, but I mean, how do you go with something like this and not have that? I mean, I guess hopefully it would be worth it. I'd almost want to test ride it. I think before I before I committed to that, that's a lot of money. But I guess maybe it'd help with resale a bit too. So we could put $1,500 side cases on, $800 top case, oh man, $300 tank bag. Honestly, a lot of this stuff is probably pretty darn nice. Some big old auxiliary lights. Whoop, come on. Whoa. I don't know why we went with square. Does it already just come with these? I guess that's kind of nice. Not a huge fan of the square, but I think I could probably come up with something a little bit cheaper than $700 on my own. Get your windshield. Oh, just a taller one. Quick shifter. Ah, that would be kind of nice. <laughs> now, let's move on before I find anything else that I want. All right. Oh, is this it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. $22,839.95. So the difference between the out-the-door cost of my 2022 KLR and just the quoted price of this is $15,838.95. So that's only $5,839.95, more than I paid for the Tenere 700. Now, obviously, this bike is not meant to compete with the KLR 650, nor is it intended to compete with the Tenere 700 either. I mean, this is a huge motor. This is a huge bike. This is really meant to sort of get Harley riders interested in off-road adventure type riding, uh, which is, I mean, the, probably the biggest growing segment of motorcycling. But, I mean, it's really meant to compete more with the giant touring bikes, like the huge BMWs, the huge KTMs, the African Twin. I mean, it, it it's really meant more for that. I think if you're looking for something like this and you don't mind spending this type of money, Man, I think this is a great option from a KLR uh, to, if you're looking for something bigger. But because of the price and because I'm not really looking for something bigger than the KLR, um, mostly because I know that I will still continue to try to take it on single track and uh, out on the ice and the rivers and stuff in the in the winter time. This is just not this is just not what I'm interested in right now. So I I don't think it's something, I know it's something that I couldn't afford and I don't think it's really something that I want now. However, I think if the time ever comes uh, and something becomes available on the used market, I would definitely be interested in testing one of these out. I'm a little bit concerned that if you put bar risers on this, you wouldn't be able to see this nice display. And I don't know if you can move the display. I wouldn't think so. I think this is all just for the windshield. Uh, so that's a little weird. But man, I mean, honestly, I, I would not be too displeased to have one of these things sitting in the garage. So if anybody ever has one up for sale and can let it go for around 10 grand, I would definitely be interested in testing one of these things out. But it's just not in the cards right now. So hopefully this video was helpful and informative with you guys. If it was, make sure to let me know down in the comment section. If you want to check out what I actually do decide to go with, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, guys. Take care, stay safe, stay swanky. Get out, enjoy this beautiful world any chance you get. And hey, if you can't do that right now, here's some more videos to check out. In the meantime, I really hope you haven't been able to hear the chickens uh, crowing this whole time. Or the kids yelling.